All right, we are on air, everybody. Hi, my name is Kayla Spelling, and I just wanted to welcome you guys here to our It's Just Film Talk. Um, we did this back in December, and it went pretty well. And so I decided or decided to invite some of the same panel, and then we have some new people as well. Um, and anyone can join in on this if I send an invite out. So hopefully we'll get more people responding. But if not, if you have any questions that you want to ask directed to anyone here, you can tweet at um, hashtag It's Just Film Talk on Twitter, and hopefully we'll get that answer for you. So, um, guys, what we're going to do is I'm just going to go down the row, um, how I see it here, and just introduce yourself, kind of talk about what you're doing, what you've done, kind of a thing, and uh, then we'll go from there. Um, except for the silhouette there, that's one of our viewers <laughs> just hanging out, so you don't have to worry about introducing yourself. But, uh, Clay, we'll start with you. Hey, what's up? Um, I'm Clay Doggett. Uh... I live in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, 22 years old, and uh, I'm an editor. Awesome, okay. What All right, today? Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> My name is uh, Daniel Pickett. Uh, I started as an editor, uh, and then I started going to writing, producing, and directing, and my company is working on the first television series. <laughs> and we have another project uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, the youngest person that was ever executed in American history happened in 1944. We're shooting a documentary about it. Um, it's going to be this spring. So I'll give you updates on that. I'll we'll probably talk more about it. Um, but, uh, it should be pretty interesting. That's pretty much me in a nutshell. Okay. All right, Jorge, you're up. My name is Jorge Arzek. I'm a filmer, filmmaker residing in New York City. Um, I graduated from the School of Visual Arts uh, on 23rd Street in Manhattan uh, with a degree in cinematography. Um, I recently shot a film in Mexico City, which I'm trying to promote um, in Spanish, and uh, I'm now currently residing working freelance in New York City uh, doing electric, uh, gaff, and uh, all sorts of video HD recording editing. Very cool. All right, PJ. What, you skip two people? How does this work? Uh, my name is PJ Schenkel. Um, I have a production company in Tennessee called Blue Hat Media, and I do film photography and graphics. And I work Very a lot. Cool. <laughs> As we all do. Um, okay, and from some of you that were here before, is there any news or anything going on, like new projects that you're working on, awesome things that happen to you that you want to talk about? Yeah, Clay and I were working on a film uh, that we shot in his hometown, Providence, uh, Providence Rhode Island. Um, we did a couple of fun rigs, uh, car mounts and stuff like that, and shooting in very low-light conditions with very minimal lighting uh, on the one of the newer Sony FS700 cameras. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. Um, really pushed the camera to its limits, and we got a really interesting image uh, working on that project. It was a lot of fun. We're almost done with it. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm just doing the color, and I think Jorge is actually he's playing around on his guitar right now for his score. But uh, yeah, no, I, like, we had a lot of fun uh, co uh, collaborating up here. We shot it in like 48 hours, um, all at night. It was a bit of a run around, but uh, yeah, I think we nailed it. It's uh, it's gonna premiere this Friday at a theater in Providence for like because it's kind of like a uh, the film is called uh, Providence which is the name of the town, um, and then it's going to be online and uh, yeah, promotional work, getting more work and uh, all that good stuff. Well, that's awesome, yeah, and um, Jorge, send me that information and I'll uh, send all that out and stuff once that gets out to the public. Yeah, not. cool, we will do. Okay, anyone else, PJ, anything cool going on in your life? Oh, uh, photo shoots, band shoots, um, I'm going to be tagging along with NASCAR for a couple events because uh, there's this band that is singing a bunch of, uh, they've got 20 shows booked for 20 NASCAR events and I gotta, I'm got i going to go cover with them in the pit and stuff. Um, other than that, uh, some doctor videos, autism therapy, uh, and then i got another one going with a chiropractor paying the bills. 
What about you, um, Daniel? Anything going on with you? Yeah, um, just the products I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> mostly free for uh, uh, I mean, get, get everything situated first with the funding. Then second, there was a grant which was good for the documentary that was the process. Uh, so now that we, we got the under, uh, 45 days from now, we should be getting the grant for that documentary that we start shooting in March. But it's been, since our last conversation, there's been a lot of free pro for me. And I'm not, I'm not personally a big fan of free pro. Uh, I like production and post a lot better. That's just me, though. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's a headache to, to me. It, it's uh, all the paperwork and all the, the, the all the legal stuff too. Uh, I'm I'm just waiting for every, all of that to pass so I can just actually just start shooting. So, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Is deep in poop right now. Well, oh, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Too, so you guys should look them up. What was that? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, I'm working with yeah. a company called Corona Entertainment, so if you ever get a chance, just look them up. Um, they're just starting out, but they have some ambitious projects. Well, um, to the creepy silhouette, um, since you're a viewer on here, um, I was basically leaving this up just kind of as a discussion thing. Um, so if anyone has any questions um, that they want to ask any of these filmmakers um, on Twitter, since most of you are just watching this via YouTube, um, if you hashtag it's just film talk, you can um, type your question in there. And I have it up live right now, so I'll see if any of you guys are asking anything. But uh, we'll start with you, silhouette person. Um, do you have any questions that you want to ask these filmmakers? Yeah, I'd like to know what um, was one of the most important lessons that they've learned along the way and how that's influenced their filmmaking. Okay. Yeah, and we'll just go down the row. So, Clay, we'll start with you. Um, important lessons. Uh, shit. Um, probably <laughs> getting fired. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I started at the age of 18, uh, you know, pretty green in New York, pretty starry-eyed. Um, I had a couple people that really wanted me to do well, and then I had a couple people that really wanted me, you know, not working uh, at where they were working because I was so young. So um, getting fired uh, at the age of 19 and having to figure out, you know, if I was going to go to college or what I was going to do and... Um, I don't know. Really, that was huge. And then also working constantly. Uh, I don't know. It's a weird thing because, like, it's a it, it's like a combination. But really, uh, getting fired, huge wake up call. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I would say. Um, like one of the biggest lessons, I mean, it's similar to getting fired, it's just uh, failure. You know, um, it's surprising how much you learn from failing at something, especially if that something has to do with your passion and what you want to do, like filmmaking. Um, what I found in a lot of my friends that want to do uh, filmmaking and be a part of it, they're afraid to fail. So a lot of the times, they don't even get started. They just, they kind of wait for you know, all the right things to have line up before they actually try it. And then they find out years later, uh, those things never line up. But then they never really get into it. They, they were afraid to fail. Um, I said the biggest thing is to embrace failure, learn from it, and it only makes you a better filmmaker. All the greats. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's nothing... There's nothing um, that's as easily understandable as, as being able to understand what it's like to uh, go through failure. It looks like we lost Daniel, uh, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully we can come back in. But um, when you make your mistakes, obviously that's, that goes along with saying, uh, you know, anyone, anyone can learn from their mistakes. 
Um, but in, in regards to um, what I closely follow, I have three three mottos actually. Um, while you're producing, it's better to have too much and not need than to need and not have. That's always that's always like rule number one. You always want to give yourself enough, and not just enough, more than enough, in case that you start to lose um, whatever you have that that's at your disposal. You can have something to sort of cushion. Uh, the second thing is while you're shooting. It's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Sometimes in the moment you can get carried away with a particular shot. Um, like Clay and I experienced recently, we didn't really uh, have the opportunity to get permits because we were so short on time and stuff like that. So we just went out, you know, if you just go out and you kind of do it and you smile and you're very respectable, you know what you're doing, uh, as long as you're not out to cause any trouble, you can get what you want um, <laughs> without the necessary thing. And it is better to go get official. That contradicts going with like the better to have too much and not need it and need not have. But definitely in a, in a given moment, especially when you're working underneath someone who's like, do this for me, and be like, are you sure? Like it's not private. It's like just do it. <laughs> yeah. And the third thing is, um, uh, no one's ever gonna know it until you show it. This applies for everything in in from post production writing yourself as as a professional. If you don't apply yourself, if you don't show people that you're that you're um, not necessarily confident, but competent in doing something, then they won't know that until you show it. So it's, it's the same thing that goes along with I'm learning in film promotion as well now. You have to really put yourself and apply yourself in order to get people to understand and know what you're doing. It's not like you know things just suddenly come to you. You really have to reach out and you know, kind of wave a banner and says, hey, look what I'm doing, uh, or this is what I do, and, uh, and every, everything else should follow. Totally. I've learned that preparation is the make it or break it to most shoots. Um, I'm filming at least three times a week, whether it's for a commercial thing or creative thing, um, personal, business, whatever it is. And without having most of it worked out, I mean, you got to leave yourself some wiggle room because um, there is that possibility that everything will tank on shooting, you have to be able to work on the fly. And I think that's why all of us kind of do this, just because we like having that sort of dynamic element um, to our profession versus having a desk job or something. I'm sure all of us are a little quirky in our own ways, and this works for us. But, you know, as your shoots get bigger and bigger, um, having everything worked out is paramount to the success um, and having the end product in mind for what you're doing. So while you're winging it, you do have that ability because you know you can uh, planning out to have X, Y, and Z in the event of X, Y, and uh, you know A, B, and C um, has really been a beneficial thing for me to figure out, and I think that that's probably the most important thing that I've learned so far. Um, one question that I had someone ask was, um, when do you know um, when a script is good and if it's ready to shoot, and then? If so, like, what's the process of getting it there? Who wants to go first? Good. Who's uh, anybody? Uh, Ty, let's well, start with you. I don't write scripts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I've seen uh, I've seen a good amount of scripts, and I don't know. To me, when I when I see something and I read it and I can see it. And, and uh, Jorge and I are always saying, like, I can see the colors and I can hear the music. And you just sort of, you feel it in your sort of mind's eye more, more than anywhere else. Um, and, uh, and that's coming from not a writer. I mean, like, when it speaks to me as just words and I can see it and picture it, then, then I'm ready to put the effort in. But, you know... It sometimes it, it, it might go over my head or something like that, so it's always like I like to work with people who are good at writing, um, and I usually can find those people through my gut. <clears throat> and, and the question again is more about uh, sure. how, how do you know if it's good? That is the question. Okay. Um, I would say. Uh, Giving a chance for other people to read your script and to see if they understand it or to see if it flows better. Uh, uh, that was a good um, My friends and I have always done that. We've always uh, write the first draft or the second draft and then share it with, with friends and family and see what they actually think. You'd be surprised how honest you are. They'll say this line doesn't sound right or 
No, this part is boring. Or this part is redundant. Why do you why did you put that in there? Um, and then just go back to drawing board and continue to need to, you know, craft it up. Also, you can always go to scriptlab.com. They have a lot of um, tidbits on how to structure the story and script together before you actually start putting the script up. Uh, structure is key in making it work and flow better. So, uh, scriptlab.com is one, one website you can use to, um, to make sure your script is, uh, is a good one. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree a lot, especially with uh, going with your gut. Um, instinct is, is, by all means, the number one uh, voice in my head that I ever listen to. Uh, and usually it's gotten me in the right place so far. Um, but to, to know whether a script is good or not, it's, that's always kind of something that's objective in, in what uh, uh, Daniel said. Uh, it is wise to share your script. To go ahead and get other people to get you know get some fresh pair of eyes on it because I mean I don't know about you guys but I always feel like it's like this script's amazing whenever I'm writing it like I freaking love this <laughs> you know like uh, so you have to get someone else to kind of kind of be like hang on slow down you know and and whether or not you can actually take their advice and heed their advice is a, is a whole other science because I know I'm guilty of it too where it's just be like I like your suggestion but I'm not gonna do it um, <laughs> definitely showing it to the right people who you trust uh, who you may you worked creatively with before especially in a different department you know say you just want to share it with the cinematographer that you always work with and be like, so what do you think about this? Like, how would you shoot it? And be like, no, I'm not so sure about the story. Or like, just honestly collaborating between other other people. Uh, and ex about execution and, and, you know, getting down to the specifics like they said, color, tempo, rhythm, everything about it. Um, see if it feels right. I'm going to say uh, that a script is good if I can sell it. Um, when I show other people what's the reaction to it, you know, um, as Daniel mentioned, um, and if it's going to be something that's going to be repeatedly good, um, what's the next steps to it? Is it something that I can take to the next level and maybe get some funding behind to make it into a profitable project? Um, that's really important for me, and it's not just necessarily if it's good and if you connect with it. For me personally, it's got to wow the hell out of me, and if I'm going to commit that much time into doing this kind of project where I can really um, uh, creatively get that stimulation that I'm looking for to go do this project, it's got to be awesome. And I'm looking for that whenever I'm reading a script. That's um, another so, <laughs> Whether or not you can yeah. sell it. No, so, say you have a good script, um, and you know it's good, you know that, okay, this is solid, this is probably going to be a moneymaker for me. What would be the next step? Um, how, it's gonna be a <laughs> no, yeah. how are you going to get that money? <laughs> uh, usually the, the standard process, I think it's, it starts with a line producer. If you want to go official, if you want to actually get in, you know, uh, you know, you know uh, SAG actors and go everything, go the, go the whole uh, however many yards it is, I forget. Uh, if you want to go all the way, um, get a line producer to budget and break down the script. Uh, get an assistant director to create your schedule. Sometimes a line producer does that as well. Um, see if it's feasible, how much money you need. Um, then talk to people about raising it, um, raising the money. Um, some budgets can vary from anything between fifty dollars to five hundred million dollars, um, even higher, probably. So it's just a matter of like, what's your target audience? Who do you want to uh, sell the script to? Who do you want to make the movie for? Uh, how much of that audience do you think you can reach out to, and then get them to see your film? Um, and start making a business plan. Make a little press packet. But make it neat, tie a bow around it, and talk to some to some wealthy people. Um, you, I, I've a uh, number one thing you want to do is figure out what your return investment is. So, if you figure out this is something that you're going to go and run with, um, I like to make a packet, a pitch packet. Make sure your script's registered. Um, make sure you've got yourself protected. Make sure you have an entertainment lawyer. Uh, if it's something you really want to do. You gotta spend money to make money. It's gonna be, uh, I mean, not always. I mean, you've got uh, Blair Witch Projects um, and and uh, Paranormal Activity, uh, very brilliant projects. Um, but you gotta still break it down and figure out what to do from there. Um, is it gonna be something that you're gonna need an agent for? Who are you gonna talk to? And and when you're finding these people, don't take the first recommendation that somebody throws you to. You want to shop around. Because number one, you don't know them that well. They're going off of uh, you know referral. Can you trust this person? 
three, what's their experience level, what projects have they done before, can they're actually applying or not support from the entertainment industry. Um, you got to kind of protect yourself and kind of like think twice before you go and act. Um, preparation is really important, return on investment, and then finding somebody that can help you. If you're the creative person, if you're the idea guy, having a partner or other people on your team of, of your production people that you work with, that can be that salesperson to go in and just put that down the line and say, this is my thing, I'm looking for $50 million, and just say it straight face. If you're not confident in that and you're not with somebody who also has that confidence, when somebody asks you what your budget is and you're like, well, I think it's going to be $5 million and you're waiting to see what they say, if I was an investor, I would say, get this kid out of here. I'm not going to invest $5 million in him. So have confidence in yourself too. Yeah. Um. Fire. <laughs> Um, all right, silhouette person. Um, is there anything else that you want to find out? Yeah, I'd like to know where um, some of you all draw your inspiration for film. So many films today are being repeatedly made over. Some good, some are a total fail. Um, and it just seems like creativity is missing in a lot of these films and these remakes, you know, films that they're doing. So where do you individually draw your inspiration from when you all go to either write a script or to film? Clay, we will start with you. Um, it usually comes from like I uh, really really simple ideas. Like says, um, it's strange. Like I'll like I'll think about a, like a situation, um, like probably, for example, this one that I just shot. We were sitting around going, I want to, you know, shoot something, I've got a couple ideas, and then we just, a couple friends will sit down and talk about, we talked about uh, circumstance and uh, uh, and chance, and just two ideas, and then sort of just coming up with a story that, uh, that feels uh, authentic to everyday life, but also authentic to sort of a sort of it's like a dream that you're sort of trying to catch it, uh, I think that's the, how I want to say it but it's it, it's like a I don't know it's like you're trying to sort of make something that speaks first to you and then secondly to your uh, to people that you respect and I'm not really speaking the way I'm I'm thinking, hold on, I think. Can you want to go in? I get what you're saying. Yeah, um, no, I, I definitely connect with what, um, what um, something has been saying. Uh, for me, it starts with life experiences and, um, and, and, and personal experiences that you may have, whether it's um, emotions or a sad emotions or bad emotions, you know, um, that's, at least that's where I get my inspiration from. And from that, I also uh, watch movies that are very creative, not the typical blockbuster movie that, um, that, you know, like, like people do. It isn't necessarily that creative, it's just uh, they had a lot of money you know, to pump into the movie. Um, things like uh, uh, the, the Tree of Life, Melancholia, those types of films that are um, unorthodox. For me, um, bring out the right experiences in my writing. So when I write the script, I'm thinking of unique ways and how to uh, express life experiences in a unique way through film, visually. And another and another thing too that I like about those films is a lot of the times they don't they don't focus on voiceovers either. And that's another thing a novice writer can do. They don't use voiceover for simple dialogue and characters to push the story. But a lot of times with these great films, it's visual. The the shots, the, the cinematography, the movement, that's all, you know, a language. No words are spoken, but you're getting a story from it. Um, so it's a mixture for me. It's a mixture of life experiences, um, studying good creative films that may not be popular, but are just you know, landmarks. You know, 
change the course in, in any way. Um, well, maybe not change the course, but because um, a lot of people don't, a lot of people know about this film. But um, definitely are, are ambitious to the filmmaking process. Um, so yeah, I would say for me, it's a mixture of those two things. But, um, that's where I get my inspiration. Um, I think you're quite, you you were asking kind of um, I guess the the lack of creativity in films. I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of have to say that of the the few films that I, I've seen recently, uh, such as Beats of the Southern Wilds, uh, Django. I think um, there's a there's another list of films that I could go down. A lot of their nominated for Oscars this year. Um, I think showed showed a very um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say unique, but a, but uh, a new almost uh, enlightening approach to filmmaking. Um, we saw, saw a lot of new techniques, a lot of you know new sensations that I, I don't recall I really necessarily seen before. Well, with all the standard uh, traditional you know principles of filmmaking, I think there is still you know uh, hope to say that that filmmaking hasn't become all the same. That there's no creativity anymore. I think um, putting things together and being able to kind of harness the creative energy into uh, to producing a film like that. The ideal thing to do is to uh, to. <coughs> Do the opposite of what what the question you were asking, so it's like, um, I think just keep doing what you what you feel inside your gut. That's kind of another, another thing um, to try and avoid that normal. Uh, I guess I, I think it's trying to answer what your question is. <laughs> yeah, there there has been a lot of um, there was sort of a period in the last two years where there was a lot of okay movies um i think that's fantastic <laughs> i mean that that's more there's more room for us now you know uh, yeah. which is great you know uh i think a lot of inspiration comes from life experiences like daniel mentioned he, he did a great job summing it up um a lot of times something either funny or emotional or it's like you know, a learning experience is there something that moves you that when you're done you want to share with other people so when people walk away from viewing it, they go, hmm, I think about something. Is it going to be funny? Is it going to, you know, give them nightmares? Is it going to, you know, when they go and they eat an ice cream and sit there and walk on the sidewalk or whatever, is it going to make them think differently about life? Um, either that or something you want to make us you know? Uh, and a lot of that, is, it's kind of off the cuff. I think that's what a lot of creativity is, is that random idea that pops into your head that's just, oh, I think I'm going to run with this. And your, um, I guess that gut that everybody sort of seemed to mention that this is something that I think people would get or would make an impression. I think that that's where I draw my inspiration from is normally that kind of either statement or life inspiration that I think would, you know, have an impact of some sort. No, I definitely agree. Um, so, how do you guys go about choosing your crew? Do you, you have a movie in mind? Do you guys normally stick with the same people, um, or do you normally just kind of go with, you know, basing off of the film? And, um, availability. Yeah, uh, availability. That's how you go about finding a crew. <laughs> that is a big factor. Uh, uh Dan? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I was. Uh, wait, what is that? Type? Who's typing? Who isn't typing? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I always think to see, um, uh, people that I work with all the time. That's just me. It's just a, it's uh, talking about the crew. Of course. Just DP, you know, first AD, you know, uh, camera operator, a gaffer. Uh, I like to. See, people just because um, you build loyalty that one and you know that this person is taking your project seriously because they take you seriously. And they're not there necessarily for a check. They're there because they believe in you. You know, and, and that, that goes such a long way than, um, uh, than just hiring them. I've, uh, you know, I work with a, with a good group of people. Um, I have some people that I like to work with on a regular basis because, you know, having chemistry on set is something that, I mean, you can't even articulate it into words. Whenever you just you work with somebody enough and you see something, you're on the same page, 
and you just look at each other and you don't even have to say anything. You just go. Um, that's priceless. Uh, and, and it's hard to find that, you know, um, and uh, they're not always available. That happens. That's why it's really good to stretch your feet and you stretch your legs into, you know, your network of people. Networking is king in this industry, absolutely king and paramount. If you don't like people, get into another industry. Um, it really just depends. Referrals are a huge thing. I don't really, I typically don't hire somebody unless they have some good referrals and, you know, some good content, you know. Um, maybe I'll ask for a resume. Uh, it really just depends on the, on this, you know, what the position is. If it's a makeup artist, you know, I'm going to see who they've worked on and what their projects look like. Um, if it's a, if it's a DP, I'm absolutely going to look at his footage. Um, if I'm looking for a production assistant, I might just want to have a phone call with them and see if they have a good attitude. It really just depends. Yeah, I would agree with that too. But, but, but the position really depends on who yeah. you know, work with someone you already did work with or hiring someone new. Um, makeup artist is a good example. You know, you can stick with the same one, but you, you can meet someone at a networking event, and and their skills are the whole they're so much stuff. better. Like, yeah, it's yeah, like, you know um, what I mean. And what do you do? Say, Hi, I'm hiring you now. You know, that's I mean yeah. that happens. You go up on set and you outdo somebody. You know. So, Whenever, if anybody's looking to climb the corporate ladder in in the film world, um, one of my very best friends is is down in New Orleans right now doing just that. Um, he just sold absolutely everything he had in Louisville. He had a production company that was doing fairly well, and he was like, "Well, I want to work on movies now." Um, and he's been on Django Unchained, uh, Man with the Iron Fists. Uh, he's helped, you know, he's been on set with Leo and and all all those guys. And um, it's really about just you know going in there and working hard and. You may think that people don't see, but they do. Um, don't necessarily go in there and be in the director's face because if he has a hundred things going on, which typically directors do, the last thing he wants to see is some little punk in his face going, "Hey, can I help you with anything?" I mean, I want to punch those guys in the face. Do know your role, work your tail off, be reliable and resourceful. If you stick your neck out there enough, people will realize it and they'll start to call you more. Hey. Um, availability. <laughs> um, there's um, there's a lot of uh, I have I have a, my phone book of people that I usually like to call um, film school is where I met a lot of people that I like to work with. Uh, yeah. Really, um, outside of film school, it can be it's well I guess it's one of those questions that um, you can't really answer yet because I think I'm a little bit too young to answer that question. But um, my so far my experience in in working in this industry is is a little bit like like you said as well, um, you know, staying staying humble, staying hardworking um, as a crew member will help you get places. I had the privilege to uh, be on set with Philip Seymour Hoffman recently, and that that project was um, started me started out me getting onto it as an assistant cameraman um, was because I had, I was working with the DP of a project we were doing at corporate video, and he and he says, "Do you know how to set up lights?" I go, "Yeah, sure." And so I set up a light, and and he sees that I'm. Um, I have some kung fu with with uh, you know setting up knuckles and, and whatnot, um, and he was like that was good. And so then he, he got my number, he got my contact, and then I've been working very closely with him um, uh, since that since that time. So yeah, um, I think that was the round of the question. Yeah, I obviously don't shoot uh, as much as I um, work in post, but whenever I do, I feel like. Um, for me, uh, a small group of people that are not going to have conflicting ideas and are going to be able to speak with their eyes and not with their mouths <laughs> and just kind of just know and, and not create a weird vibe. Um, I mean, I personally, I, I think I respond more to documentary style sort of things. So I, I love the idea of like the old school filming where it was just, you know, like, an audio guy and a camera guy, and then your subject, and then just sitting with them in a room for as long as possible. Um, but yeah, that's my two cents. <laughs> uh, well, there's kind of a side discussion going on via chat room. Um, I kind of wanted to bring to light. Um, someone was asking about basically females um, in terms of the filmmaking work world. Um, in the entertainment industry and was just asking, you know, is it really truly hard or much more harder for females to gain recognition um, and credentials in the film industry to get respect and attention? 
it's all political, really. Um, as far as Hurt Locker and the Grammys go, like let's take Argo for example. Argo is a fantastic movie that wound up not really you know, getting snubbed for whatever reason. Hurt Locker beat out Avatar. You know th th that had a lot more, you know, buzz to it because she and James Cameron were married. Um, it's it, it, getting anywhere in the film industry. It's not about what you know; it's, it's who you know. Um, and if you know, regardless if you're you're female, you're white, you're Mexican, you're black, you're Asian, whatever the hell it is, it really comes down to how you play the game and how hard a worker you are. Because work ethic is something that you really can't teach to somebody. Either you have it or you don't. So if said female was, you know, busting it, you know, it's it's really just up to, you know, whoever the individual is and whether or not you want to make it or not. Luck has a lot to do with it, um, but you wouldn't have luck. I mean, luck, to a certain extent, you create your own luck. Um... So wait, so what was the exact question? It's, 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 what? <laughs> Just about um, women and the filmmaking industry. Um, you know, is it harder for them to gain respect and attention? Um, I think different, different roles will be easily filled by a woman and would not be filled by a man. And I've seen, like, uh, like coming from post-production, almost every executive producer that works at Post Houses in New York is a strong female. And almost all the editors, maybe a handful, are guys. And then there's maybe one or two girls. Um, the client services and receptionists, typically female. Um, so it's it, there is definitely a gender position that's there, but, I, I mean... I, anyone with a voice and an idea and you know and the balls to break out of it can do so it's just like like there's a herd to fall into and and uh, I don't know it's I mean I've seen some really amazing females in the workplace who have started off in client service and now are you know producing giant Super Bowl campaigns and it just came from like what everyone's talking about working really hard and uh, just kind of saying, you know, give me a chance. Look, I've been giving you your perfect coffee for you know, <laughs> for a while now. Like, so yeah. No, I don't know. It's it's uh, there's definitely uh, a uh, a bit of a hole that you can fall into as a man and a woman. It's just unfortunately, I guess. I don't know. It's just like anything, sports or yeah. <laughs> Daniel Jorge, do you have any insight on that or I, yeah, I would I would agree uh, with a lot of what PJ and Clay were saying about um hard work. Because uh, I think ultimately the industry what they what they want is to know uh, are you able to um, deliver? Are you able to deliver a product that um, eventually makes the industry money? Um, I think, I mean, of course, it's always been this thing, you know, this whole workplace thing, male versus female, you know, there is this battle going on. It's not just in our industry. Um, but I think what PJ was saying also in, in the chat, too, um, so that there's a lot more opportunity in our industry because we are a creative medium. And ultimately what matters is the creative medium that we're, cre that we're putting together. And whether it's male or female, if the product is good, uh, there's room for it. But we we want you, even the uh, the investors, the producers, all of the money makers, the studios, they just want their bank accounts paid. And if you can get butts in the seats and, and make them money, there's definitely going to be a lot of this agenda. So uh, the biggest thing is to work on the craft. Don't 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 second guess yourself. Because of your your sex or your your race or whatever, there is there is nothing holding you back, and that's why I love this industry. I really feel like all they look at is they don't want to see, they don't want to hear anything. They don't want to hear about your top story or your victory story or whatever. Where's the product? And I think that's what it comes down to: is can you deliver? That's my two cents. Good call. Yeah, I think I think it's a very strong 
uh, philosophy to embody. Um, it's something that that I'd hope all filmmakers uh, practice uh, when when dealing with certain things. I'm not going to lie, though. I have seen in certain situations, um, uh, you know, where people will not just women, but also men, you know, using whatever portions of their, their sexuality to to get to where they they need to be. Um, it's an industry that's that's. I mean, it's it's something that's you know is is frequently dealt with actually, and it's as as I would like to you know really eliminate anything gender related and sort of say focus on what's what's going on here, what's the person doing. Um, you know, it, it is an industry, and I'm sure there's many others where you see uh, gender being some a, a factor into how uh, someone gets someplace. Not to say that uh, you know one is more of a culprit than the other. Um, mm -hmm. but I've definitely worked a lot better with with uh, members of the opposite sex um, than ever men. And then in a certain situations, I'll turn around and say, "Well, no, I think I was able to collaborate visually more with men." And though, and though I, I know that there are studies, I can't specifically break down which ones they are and who the, who did them. That say that the structure of in the way that you know a brain, the neurons within a brain of a specific gender do operate differently than the other. And so I think you know, um, admitting that since there are some specific differences in both hemispheres to harness the both of them and to incorporate and, and find a balance, find a unison to, to push forward using the boat. Um, whatever happens in the mix, I guess that's, that's none of anyone's business. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I smell it just happening. Yeah, no, for real. Uh, having a well-rounded crew is definitely more beneficial than having a, a singular yes man, yes sir, yes ma'am, whoever crew. Cool. All right. Um, well, Clay, since you are into the whole post-production aspect, um, mm -hmm. I'm just curious, what kind of editing software do you use? Like, what do you prefer to work on? Uh, depends how I'm feeling. No, um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I think um, Professionally, in a commercial industry, working in a building where you're, you know, working on a on a shared hard drive space and things like this, where you're, you know, have lots of computers working on the same projects, lots of editors working on the same projects, without a doubt, Avid. Um, and uh, if you're gonna, you know, shoot something and don't want to sit around and transcode and, you know, Final Cut. Um, it's also, you know, Jorge kills it on Sony Vegas. So, you know, it's like there's a, there's basically whatever you want to, or uh, sorry, uh, like whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, I love Avid. I think it's amazing. I love Final Cut 7. I don't touch 10. Uh, After Effects is like a bottomless pit. You should constantly be playing around on that. And Premiere is something that as good, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think it's okay. Uh, it's, it works well with After Effects, but if you're, you know, a, good at editing, then so does everything else. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, color correction. I use color. Uh, DaVinci now, you can install that for free on your yeah, that's DaVinci Light is now a software. No shit. Yep. And uh, and and Smoke for Mac now is is huge and changing a, a lot of what's happening in post. Uh, smoke is I'm not sure if you know, but there's like Smoke and Flame, which are used for like conforms and final touch-ups and stuff. Um, that was always run off of this you know huge machine. Now it's can be on the same machine that the offline editor is using. So. Uh, that's something that's huge in, in the industry, but is also scaring the crap out of everyone because it just is eliminating. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could talk about it for a while. But... <laughs> <laughs> Are you? Was that all about it? or smoke? Uh, say again. You were highlight. Uh, you highlighted a program. You, you said the Da Vinci, and then you were talking about smoke and flares and whatnot. Do you smoke for that, or have you heard of Action Essentials? 
Um, no, yeah, no. Uh, the software is actually called Smoke. Uh, it's run by um, Autodesk. They have a couple Autodesk. of them. Okay, yeah, um, I've heard of Autodesk. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure about the other one. I've only, you know, I've worked with assistants who work on those machines, um, so I've had to, like, step in, but I, I'm by no way a proficient uh, conform artist. Have you seen the, uh, what does the DaVinci software look like? Because I know what the DaVinci machine looks like, and it's like a freaking entire yeah, room with dials and stuff. <laughs> it's like a space station. Yeah. yeah. Okay, man. But I it doesn't know. need to be. It can also be a mouse. <laughs> it doesn't take longer. <laughs> I hope um, you watched that before you held it up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 cool. Uh, yeah. One thing that I was thinking, um, just as a random question, for the most part, and I, I'm assuming this is obviously too depending on the project, what you're working on, um, but in terms of the videographers, do you guys edit m most of your projects or all of your projects, or do you go to someone else to do the editing for you that you just kind of administer and kind of say what you want? I edit everything. <laughs> <laughs> edit, edit, absolutely everything, but I am looking to hire an editor soon. Um, not, it really depends on the budget. Fight? If there's a budget for it, um, hell yeah, I'll send it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's um, a kicker, right? He's laughing his ass off. Yeah, for real. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm laughing at Clay because he's he's like, hey, what's up? <laughs> um, Clay is actually someone that I. Um, I've been wanting to work with a long time and finally got the chance to work with in Providence because Clay's got cuts. Um, Clay showed me uh, a commercial he once edited for uh, it was some leftover footage for from a, a commercial shoot of, a, of people on a train uh, platform and and I guess they put on um, yeah you know which one uh, they put on he, you know he, he did this fantastic collaboration of, of uh, with the music from Up and and made it into a short film which was was really brilliant and. Uh, Good types of editors who you should uh, take your work to know how to use all the footage. Um, if it depends on the, also the client. If a client's coming to you and say, "I want you to shoot and edit something," you're like, "Okay, <laughs> okay." Um, but then, if if you're looking to someone to take over a project, you want to pick an editor who knows how to use uh, the footage, who knows how to handle the footage, and use little bits and pieces. For example, say uh, in the middle of a take, they they you know the director comes along and and starts giving direction, but the the person that the camera is on has a certain expression that they're listening to, and then the person can say, "I can use this take as if you know, you know something right. like that." You know, using all the material that's there, um, an editor who knows how to just take that and just chop it up and, and make something cool. Which sometimes be hard for the person that was the person who was actually talking to them. True. Also, okay. <laughs> that's something that I should use, like rather than like, okay, fast forward, I'm talking here. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Sometimes it just falls into place. Being able to recycle footage, like whenever I get footage from a client, like say, uh, like I don't always just ca uh, just shoot and then edit. Like sometimes people come to me uh, with footage, and you know it's not always the best footage. Uh, can you make something of this? Here's where I think all the best footage is, and I say no, give me all of it because the way that I think about projects, I'm sure he's, I'm sure all of you guys are the same way. What one person thinks is usable or not usable isn't necessary because they just don't know what to look for. And as somebody who's experienced, who's really been editing for a long time. I mean, hell, you can horizontally flip or vertically flip or reverse it or slow it down, and it's perfect. And it's just some garbage tidbit that was like roll off, you know? It's totally. don't keep all of your footage that you shoot, all of it, because you never know when you're going to find something, some kind of clip that's going to save your ass and link the entire storyline together. Yeah. And what makes a really good editor is finding, is finding those moments that no one else would choose and just making them just feel like you, like you don't even notice them like 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 when the camera like will like zoom in and blur and the camera shakes or something like that and that's right. like an emotion rather than just a guy with you know trying to like put his shoe on or something it's like it, uh, it's it's huge it's like it's what makes it like a guy like knocking it a glass over by mistake it's the it's like a simpler way of kind of the the natural um, action that happens, like whether it be on screen or behind as the cameraman, um, especially now when everyone is shooting their own stuff, you know, kids are nowadays, so they know what it looks like when a camera shakes and is out of focus. It's it's not something that we have to explain anymore. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a, and you don't, to be a good editor doesn't necessarily mean you have to be 
in your face with effects. Like, you know, he just mentioned if you can pull something off and have it subtle so people don't even notice it, you're a good editor. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Daniel, do you um, edit your own stuff? Um, yeah, usually I do. Um, cause I, that's where I started out at. But uh, I did realize that when I work with other editors, um, they offer a, a fresh pair of eyes unique to mm -hmm. um, other uh, sections in the filmmaking or, or, or processes in the filmmaking um, process. Um, like, for instance, when I mentioned having someone read your script to have a fresh pair of eyes on the, uh, on the material, um, it's not quite the same as when you let an, another professional editor edit your project. Um, because there's like this relationship between a director and an editor. And it's not necessarily mm -hmm. all flowers and rainbows either. It's more like, it's kind of like a marriage, you know, like you've been married for a while and you want it a certain way, but the editor's like, yeah, but that doesn't really flow with the story. And you're like, yeah, but I really like that shot because that shot was the shot that blah, 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 blah. And the editor's like, yeah, but it doesn't fit. <laughs> and then you start, you know what I mean? You say you're laughing because you, know, you probably went through it, right? You probably went through the whole... I mean, I love editing my own stuff, but man, I can't tell you how many creatives have come out of working with another editor. More of a headache, definitely. <laughs> More of a headache. But, at least my opinion, the project comes out a little better. Yeah, if you... Extra mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know? If you have a big enough project... If you yeah. can outsource to another editor, it's beneficial to you because you're yeah. in it so much. It's all in your head. You were there from the pre-production, which, as Daniel said, is a hell of a headache, but it's so important. Preparation is key. Um, but don't come up with things that you didn't even think about, and it could be 100% better than something I mean, you could have never even thought of if you didn't throw it out to somebody. And it's a process, you know. It's you got to hatch it out, you know. It's, but it's very beneficial, like he said, you know. <coughs> And you need money, too. Uh, that, that's another reason why I would edit my own stuff. Sometimes I just didn't have it, you know, and it's it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to find an editor that's going to edit your project for free. You know? that, that, that's a favor and a half. Free home, this is what I say to that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like, how do you ask that? You know, can you do all this hard work, all this labor for free? You know, that's just wrong. It's just... <laughs> You know. but anyway, By the way, like, sound. Like, oh, what was that? By the way, sound is another thing. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, that's sound yeah, guys. That's another thing. Sound editor or something. Man. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, sound, sound I think... can make or break. Uh -huh. Agreed. Yeah. In my opinion, I mean, I think that all post production. When done on a on for like a small scale thing, I I think that everyone who is involved with a project should be involved with every step of the way, if it's possible. But when you're working on like a commercial scale, and um, and you're hired to be a director for this job for three weeks, and then you know maybe you get a day in post, but right after that you're booked on another job. So ideally, you want to know that you're handing your, your product to something. To someone that a like you can kind of say like even if they don't do exactly what I want I I trust what they're gonna do, and um, that's what ends up happening a lot of the times and like almost probably fifty percent of the time especially with the commercials the director doesn't even come in he's like I shot it I know thank you like you know what I mean and um, and that's and that's and that's just another end of it where where it's also it's also just like you know, a game of trust between a bunch of uh, talented, uh, hard-working people. Also, cool. um, I had a Twitter question real quick, and we've actually we've had this question asked before, but just to go back to talking, um, Michelle asked, "I'm just curious, how important do you all feel it is in attending film school um, to your success in the industry?" So we'll get on the line again. Clay? <laughs> <laughs> um, I started working at a high school. I don't think it... it uh, I'm going to keep it short and say 
No, it's no, don't don't do it. Um unless you want to uh unless you want to um make a lot of really great connections with people your age and have it be sort of easy. Um it, it it'll be right there. Uh you'll be working with people you'll 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 that are wanting to do the same thing as you. It's great. There's nothing wrong with it, but 4 years later you're going to be an intern. You're not going to be anything else. Um, they don't care. You're like, I am a directing major. They're like, no, you're, you know, a guy that just walked in my building. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, as an intern at the age of 19, I was training interns who were NYU film grads who had shot thesis films, and I was younger than them. So it's like, it, it was definitely a wake up call that it was like, you know, you just have to, um, you just have to want it. Yeah, I would actually agree with that. I mean, I personally went to film school, uh, but coming out, just like Clay said, you know, you don't come out, you know, with, you know, all barrels blazing and ready to take over the industry. I mean, actually, there's more of a stigma, you know, when you say, oh, I'm a film student, I graduated already. They're already going to yep. put you in the category of, oh, he's, he must, he's not humble. He's uh, Mr. Know-it-all. You know, he thinks he knows more than I do, and I'm the director. I don't want to work with that. It's a stigma, not 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 a guarantee, but you know. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd say it depends on the person. You know, if you just want to make films, there's so many avenues for independent filmmakers to do their own projects without needing to go into the Hollywood circuit. Then you don't really need film school. If you want to go to the Hollywood circuit, you still don't necessarily need film school. But if you don't know anything about filmmaking, it's always good to get a film education. Right, right. Uh, so it depends, you know. But then again, some people don't want to spend all that money either. So, you know, what's your budget like? You know, that, that's, you know, <laughs> what's your budget? If you're going to film school, just don't do it. Just, you know, go to Hollywood and just, you know, intern somewhere and, and, and do that. If you want to make films, just, you're, you're, I mentioned this last time, an iPhone 4S will shoot pretty decently, you know, if you can't, if you can't afford a camera, look, 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 I'm just saying, look, I'm just saying, it's not the best equipment to shoot a film on, but it has been fun. It, it is headaches involved, yeah, but, did you look up the short films from these iPhones, Jorge? Yeah, I have, actually. You have. And oh, here's, some the thing, of them. And here's some what them. I want to also bring to the table as well. For, for someone, I did, I went to film school, and I will say, if you want to be a director, just study psychology. Really, study psychology and study marketing and advertising, because that's going to be a lot more beneficial. You can, I mean, you can really sit down and you can watch a film, um, you know, and and know how a movie is technically made. You can read books there. They're everywhere. They're on the internet. We have the internet. God bless. <laughs> but I went to school as a, studied as a. Cinema Um, I thought it was extremely beneficial. Um, I got to network with a lot of incredible people. Uh, I got to learn some amazing things. And in my uh, extracurricular activities, I took psychology and other like uh, you know humanities and sciences that really got me thinking about you know metaphysics, you know uh, abnormal psychology. It really got me thinking about how the mind works, and that incorporated that into my study. So it's all about what you make. Out. If you do go to school, it's it's what you take out of that school as well. What because it is an investment. And right. I had been in situations where I could be like, I'm a cinematographer. I'm like, oh, yeah, let me see a reel. I was like, sure, I got a reel, and I also have a degree in cinematography. It's like, oh, okay. You know, and, and it just kind of like adds on a little bit, and it kind of really helps, you know, really just getting the practice. And you have studio classes where you get to set up all this equipment, you get to work with it, blah, 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 right. blah. Clay, I see a point that you want to you add. Especially with cinematography. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's more of a math and a science than, I, uh, than, than you can learn by yourself just shooting, I think. It's it's for me, um, yeah. Although I have met people who didn't go to school for cinematography, um, and they have an incredible eye. Um, and you know, it was one one case where I wasn't this this person wasn't so sure about the the camera. Like, how do I change the the color temperature on this? And it was kind of like, okay, I'll show you. But I mean, this person had such an incredible eye and an amazing way of executing it. He just knows it. He feels it and he works it out. I mean, just whatever. If you go to school. If you don't go to school, just keep learning. Keep 
keep shooting, keep doing things to make yourself active instead of just sitting around and watching movies. Although watching movies is important. Um, getting back to the subject of school, I think it is important. I did benefit a lot from it, but that's also something that I knew that I was going to start pursuing ever since I was getting into it. So, yeah. My take is the short answer is it really depends on the person. Well, I mean, that was easy. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, like, think about it. You know, if, if you're somebody who is, was, like, you know, uh, a clay and was able to just kind of waltz in when you're 19, which is fabulous, man. That's a great opportunity. I mean, I definitely didn't have – when I was, like, when I got out of high school, um, I wasn't ready to apply myself and start working in that facet. Like, really, I didn't really develop my work ethic until I really got in the middle of all of, all of it and the proximity to other people who had that interest and, you know, were really hungry – there's something to be said about being close to those types of personalities. Um, so the benefit is, as everybody had mentioned, it's networking. I mean, you're going to meet people, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, that could potentially. I, I work with um, a handful of people that I met in college. I went to Western Kentucky University, so I mean, I didn't go, I didn't have the opportunity to go to a film school, um, but where I what I did have the opportunity to do was to get hands on with equipment, which I didn't really have the opportunity to do when I was in high school, or that I could have gotten into by myself. Um, and after that, you know, then I got a little bit more hungry and, and after I graduated, you know, I mean, of course I started working at Party City initially, um, and you just got to start working your way up from the bottom, but experience in networking, it's hands-on, you're going to be working with difficult people who, you know, it, it's just, it's all these things that you're going to be experiencing in the real life, but in a play atmosphere. And if you're that type of person that doesn't have that kind of opportunity to really get to that situation, then you probably benefit from that. Um, one thing I want to ask, sorry, this is kind of off topic, but um, after this talk, if you guys can post on the event page just links to blogs or um, books that you guys really think would help some independent filmmakers out, um, even just like starting out, like shooting, um, you know, who should they go to in terms of, like, I know, like, one of them's like Planet 5D or whatever, that's a good one that talks about um, new equipment and stuff coming out. One no film school is a good one. No film school. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's funny. Yeah. No. <laughs> there would definitely be a book called No Film School. And we're back to this combo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you guys don't mind, um, even like Clay, like for you, just like um, listing out because obviously we didn't know that DaVinci had that out as like a software thing that people can download. So just mm -hmm. little tips and stuff that you guys can drop for people. That'd be great. Screenwriting, like if you guys know a great book for people, you know, trying to structure out a script, that's obviously probably one of the most important things because people aren't going to pick up a script if it's not structured correctly. Um, and um, silhouette person, <laughs> do you? Oh, is it, what is that? That's American oh, cinematographer. Yeah, American cinematographer's handbook that's is right. fabulous. If you guys are going to shoot, if anybody watching on the internet world, these guys all know about it. American Cinematographer's Handbook is, like, necessary. It's super expensive, but it's good. I've yeah, got this lighting book, too, that i got to figure out what it's called. I'll find it later. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll post awesome. it. It's sitting where all my other books are, collecting dust on my shelf. <laughs> we'll get those books out and let us know. Cool. We'll um, so what, person, do you have any questions? You guys have done a great job. The only other thing I was going to ask was what are some good networking tips and tools you can suggest for breaking into the industry? Sure, sure. Kind of hear you. I think you said networking tips. Yeah. What are, yeah. What are good, mm -hmm. what are good um, resources for networking and breaking into the industry? Yeah. Yes. Clay, you want to start? And this can be for post because there's a lot of editors I'm sure that kind of want to know how do you get into a, an editing house and whatnot. Yeah. Um... I mean, it, 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 it depends where you're starting. I mean, if you're starting with zero experience, uh, you, uh, you know, hopefully maybe you got into it because you know someone who works in it already, and then, you know, it could be a production house or a post house, and, you know, internships are just a blast and um, priceless. And so that... Um, but then once you're sort of established and you sort of, you know, maybe have had a year in the industry and you want to start doing more, I mean, when you're working in an office and you're working with the same group of people, it's extremely difficult to kind of, on the down low, look for another job and, and be talking to other people 
and be moving along because you can't really let that energy uh, leak out into the office. Um, and so a lot of it comes from just like discrete um, emails and uh, and really being uh, professional about the whole process and. Um, as far as networking goes, it's like it's like it's it's dumb luck sometimes. It's like it's it's kind of one of those things where you can put yourself out there as much as you want, but unless you're doing what uh, PJ was saying, which I agree with completely, is just like putting in, just know your role, do it, and don't you know try and be that guy that's gonna win everything, and um, and then people will just start writing your name down, and then people will just start calling you. It's it's like a it's like a trust circle. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, and, and also, you can um, you can always join networking events, or um, or let's say you don't have any connection whatsoever. Um, you can always go on social media sites. They have plenty of uh, uh, film societies that meet up maybe every month or every two weeks. Um, if you just introduce yourself that way, <coughs> in terms of what the player was saying was, you know, very, that's like one of the most important things you can do, to introduce yourself. Um, and also, even even film festivals, if you go to watch these independent films, uh, and you stay for the Q&A, when the, when the cast and the crew are answering questions and stuff, you might want to stick around just to see if you can get an opportunity to ask them questions, and to introduce yourself to them, to keep you in mind. For their next project, you know, so it is a mixture of, of luck, like Clay was saying too. You know, you gotta make yourself available, but when you make that right connection, it's like it just happened. Uh, so it's a mixture of both. But you can just do those things, you know. Just look up um, uh, on Facebook and other uh, sites and see. Uh, and it, it also depends where you live too. Um, I've always lived in big cities, so. I'm not sure how it would fit if you were living somewhere like in, in the Midwest or something, very small town. I don't know if that would work necessarily. Um, but yeah, yeah, it all depends. So. Yeah, one thing I wanted to add is is uh, reaching out through through the internet um, can make someone in the middle of Iowa really the same person as the guy in in in, in New York. It's it's. The, the internet is an amazing tool for all of this, obviously. Um, and so it's, um, you know, when you see something that you like and you go like, oh my god, and you kind of sit back and go like, okay. And, and then you look up that guy and then you kind of get, you know, Facebook creepy. And you start fucking, and you just start figuring it out. And you're just like, okay, this is what he's doing right now. And you know, and then you make a connection, and then, you know, you share your films, you know, you say, hey, check out this rough cut, like, what do you think of this, like, what do you think of that, and just, like, be kind of like a monkey about it, and just kind of get everyone, uh, like, get the energy up. Yeah. I mean, I, I, earlier, I saw uh, Kayla was talking to Philip Bloom on Twitter, and that's exactly what you're I supposed to, too. yeah, you're just supposed to just, I mean, really, it's just, again, it goes back to one of my three mottos, no one's going to know it until you show it. And if you take the amount of time to really put yourself and, and dedicate this lot of time to say, make deadlines for yourself, especially if you're working freelance. I've been working freelance since um, last summer, and it took me about a good six months to get really comfortably kind of like finding a decent, like, you know, connections and meeting people. Uh, business cards do help. Um, showing up on time helps. Uh, making good impressions really help. Dressing up also helps, too. Uh, you know, just as simple as wearing like like a little button-up shirt like that, making good impressions really like because that's how it works. You make a good impression on the set, and you really satisfy the producer. They say, "I got another shoot that's coming up. Let me get you on this one because I like you." And that's it's it's as easy as that, and that's how yeah. it keeps on going. Be um, friendly with producers. <laughs> yeah, be very friendly with producers and do what you're told. And also, listen because uh, there are a lot of moments when, especially you know, doing starting as a PA. You have to listen to what people are talking about. You have to kind of pay attention. If there's something needed, you should, and you're not doing anything, you should seek out, you know, pull out a smartphone and be like, where can we find this or whatever. Just really pay attention and be there for the shoot, of course. Um, and um, network, promote, post your stuff online, make a website, make business cards. Those help too. Um, yeah. Um, what everyone else has been saying. Can you email me your business card? <laughs> Yeah, here. Let me stick it. Business cards are really good. Business <laughs> cards are 
in Nashville. I mean, people call it the Nashville handshake. It's like, hey, what's going on? There's a there's a business card in your hand. It's <laughs> um, you know, being open minded is is really important. When you meet people, you know, Google Hangout in a coffee shop or whatnot, you can't like judge a book by its cover. Um, a lot, seventy five percent of my business comes from the music industry, and half the people that I run into when I first meet them have overalls and oil on their hands. And like, I had, I learned a lesson one time where I was like, I kind of took this guy seriously. Um, he left, and somebody was like, "You know who that is? That's so and so. They've got three Grammys and like a bajillion dollars. They live in that house that's over there. That's humongous." I'm like, "Whoa!" Um, you really never know. Um, Daniel mentioned websites. Uh, I, I'm because a lot of my business comes from the music industry. I'm a member of the National Music Pros. Um, a couple of things on LinkedIn, although LinkedIn kind of just spams the hell out of my box, and I hate it. Uh, and this is actually interesting. I don't know if you guys know what Reddit is. Um, it's this huge online community. It's becoming more wide known now. But Nashville has a Reddit, a subreddit, and I met some cinematographer on there the other day. He was like, hey, I just moved to town. I have a red one. If anybody's a filmmaker, come and get me. And nobody hit him up. And I was like, shit, let me get hook up with this guy. We got coffee. He's a cool guy. I'll probably call him for a project down the road. Uh, Film festivals are good. I'm going back to my college to go judge a film festival in April. I'm going to probably look for interns. Uh, you know, be open-minded. Talk to people. If you see somebody that looks cool in a coffee house, I mean, they may be into the same things as you. It really just as easy as going and sitting down and saying, hey, what's up? Um, one person tweeted, um, which we kind of touched on a little bit, but they asked um, – like in terms of geography, does that play a part in success? So like if they live in Ohio versus Hollywood, um, can that make or break me? Depends what you want to do. If you want to work on feature films, you're not going to find it in Iowa. Go to, go to one of the places that has all those major uh, tax breaks like uh, Louisiana, South Carolina. I think Georgia has some good tax breaks. Or go to one of the epicenters where all the creativity is happening that's sucking people out from everywhere else, like Iowa, like Nashville, New York, L.A. Absolutely, 100%. You're shooting yourself in the foot by not being close to it. Anyone? Uh, yeah. You, 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 you got to be close to it. I mean, I've, I've been, you know, it's, it's gotten to the point where, you know, I, for me, I have to live close to a major city, or else I have to go to college. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's definitely <laughs> there's definitely like a there's definitely the meccas, and um, they're not going anywhere. I mean, it also though, it depends if you want to be like a corporate per filmmaker or whatnot. If because you know, it, creative filmmaking is sexier, but it's not as profitable in the beginning, you know? It's because you got to make a name for yourself and get people to trust you. But it's a lot easier to go to Ed's Carpet Warehouse because Ed's rolling in bank. He doesn't know any better. He doesn't know anything about the Internet. He just knows how to sell carpet, but he doesn't know how to film. So if you can go in there and you're good at you know talking to people, you can go and sell yourself to him and get him to pay a couple grand for a really nice commercial. And you can absolutely 100% do that wherever the hell you are. And that's one thing. Definitely an option. <laughs> totally. Good point. I uh, I I think I spend too much of my time making art. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're on the same page. Here. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. I, I I hear you. Daniel, go ahead. Oh, I actually I missed the question. Actually, I I got a <laughs> that was interrupted. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, it's just in terms of geography, you know, is it important? Like this person was saying, they live in Ohio, so um, can that make them or break them in terms of getting into the industry? Oh uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it can, it can kind of go either way. It also depends on, um, again, how you promote yourself. Because being in a big city like New York, it can be very competitive, very challenging to get to know people, and there's a lot of pressure, all that sort of thing. But, like there's there's so many other people, and then you kind of become easily disposable. Whereas you're somewhere like, you know, say, for instance, I've been making a couple of connections in Dallas. I've been actually seeming to do pretty well down there because, um, you know, there's not that many. There are There is still a community of filmmakers that are down there um, who I've just now, like, started to meet and started to get together for a bunch of projects and whatnot. Um, 
but it is easier to sort of like be like, hey, this is me. I live in Dallas. You know, if you need something, um, or like I'm back and forth between Dallas and New York, whatever. Um, you know, like I can be your go-to guy, and then you can kind of have like, you know, the land of the blind, one-eyed man is king type of type of philosophy, kind of like following around. Um, so it's it's a little bit of both, actually. It's yeah. uh, getting your feet off the ground can be challenging or difficult in a big city, small. Town. Yeah, it, it 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 depends on the person and what they what they mean by breaking into the industry. You know? Like, what, what does that mean exactly? Do you want and again, do you want to do independent films on your own, or do you want to uh, get into the Hollywood circuit? You know, and and work the what I call the Hollywood rat race. You know, um, being a production assistant. And working up the ladder that, that way, if, if, if that's your goal, it, it it might matter. It might matter where you live. Project, you create business cards, you create websites, uh, you get it out onto uh, internet film festival. Let's say you can't go to an actual film festival that's too far away. They have online ones. You can post it online, and then people around the world see the product. Then they look you up, and then now you're in the industry. You know I mean, I mean, so it, it depends on what what exactly um, what the goal is for the person. Uh, but if it's just to create art, like Clay was saying, if you want to create art, I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters where you are. I, I think what really matters is the people you surround yourself with. Are they helping you create that art? Are are they hindering you? You know, so it all depends on the goal. You know, do you want to be a or like Jorge? In many ways, of what he was saying, you want to be a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond. It all depends. What is it that you want to do, and uh, what is your goal? And try to go for big fish, big pond. <laughs> <laughs> Um, or an ocean, actually, is great. Or an ocean. Or outer space. You can just be a whole star. Um, yeah. <laughs> outer space. Done. No one's hit that territory yet. Um, the Russians did. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we're probably going to be wrapping things up here in a minute, guys. I really enjoyed the hangout. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, like, real quick, is there anything that you guys want to throw out there or ask each other by chance? I don't know. Did you wish to looking quick? <laughs> what? Nothing. We're all good. Okay, yeah, no, I think I spoke at the same time as you, so I just didn't hear you. Okay. Well, um, if that's the case, then why don't you guys just kind of, you can do like a closing thing, just kind of reiterate you know, who you guys are again, um, if you have your own company, you know, what that is and um, what you're working on and if any kind of shout out you want to give out, um, social media or anything, this would be the time. And thank you guys again for joining me and doing this. I'm glad that it worked out this time. <laughs> it was a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Yeah, it was great. Uh, uh, it's more often. Yeah. Yeah. We hang out again. <laughs> was, uh, all right. Guys, I got I don't have the sign or anything. Oh, I can show the business card. Three Hat Media. I wish I had like a ta da. No curtain. Three Hat Media. Dot com. Is that reverse? God damn it. All right. So. No, it's, it shows uh, up correctly. It shows up correctly. No, it was fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's my company. PJ Shankle, Three Hat Media. Dot com. And uh, I've got Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. Clay, Daniel, Jorge, Invisible Person, Kayla. You guys are all awesome. I enjoyed talking with you. Cool. Yeah, Stay in touch. that's awesome. Thank you, PJ. Yeah, for sure. All right, Clay, you're up. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I don't really have a website or anything. I'm a freelance editor. I have a Facebook, a LinkedIn, all, all that stuff. Uh, Jorge and I are working on a cool little short that hopefully is going to lead to some more work in the in the uh, in the c commercial industry and in the film. Uh, Jorge and I are going to be working together more, and so keep your eyes out. Um, where the film is called Providence, it'll be on uh, on video soon. And um, take care. <laughs> Thanks, Clay. Bye.
And again, my name is Daniel Pickett. Um, my company is called Zion Entertainment. That's with the X, X I O N Entertainment. We have a, a show coming out called The Sacred Eternal. Um, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of them. Just look at my name, Daniel Pickett. And I uh, hope to see you guys soon. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah. And my name is Jorge Arzac. Um, I just launched a website today. It might not work, but if you want to check it out, it's www.jorgearzac.com. If you have any questions, you can send me an email at jaacinema at gmail.com. There you go. Jorge, you're... I, I need to get one of those. All right, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you for tuning in to the It's Just Film Talk. Um, my name is Kayla Spelling. Unfortunately, if you want to hire me for any freelance work, you can't unless you live in Florence, Italy. Um, I'll be there for a year. <laughs> but... Um, Thank you guys again so much for joining in on this, and hopefully we'll be able to do this again. So Sounds good, guys. Have a good one. Kayla, tell Taylor I said hi. You should punch him for me. <laughs> All right, I will, for sure. Find a visible person. <laughs> Bye, guys. Later.